So I want to take a little bit of time to talk about ego or the separate self or the false self or the who we think we are, however you want to word it. And just kind of like break down what that thing is and how I think about it. So right now I'm walking. That is something I can say and relatively speaking, I can justify it and it makes sense. But I can also say I'm making a video and walking is happening or I'm holding the water and walking is happening or I'm talking and walking is happening and holding the water is happening or I'm walking and making a video is happening. You can put all these different little spins on who you are. And when you really start to look into it, you see that what you are and who you are is a point of attention identified with a given thought or a given concept or a given quote unquote action that's going on. But the strange thing is, is if you're not attentively identifying with and holding up a concept of I am this or I'm doing this, there is no you. There is just what's happening. Like, I just tripped on that stick and it's, I tripped on the stick, but it's just part of what's going on. You know, I didn't intend really for any of it. And, you know, in a very complicated way, I'm not intending for any of this. Speaking along the lines of like free will, I can say, I chose to walk out here. I chose to start this video. I chose to walk in the path where there was a stick that my foot was gonna catch on. But this is all just intellectual mind, the thinking mind. And when it's in attention is when we sort of, there I go, tripping again. Um, you identify with a thought form. There's this feeling, um, it's almost a resistance or a tension, literally a tension, which is kind of how I like to view the word attention. Cause you know, when you put your attention on something, really all that's going on is what's always been going on, but who you think you are is actively doing it or at least you think you're doing it and that's all that's going on when this ego arises and that brings in the idea of control and free will and how I'm somebody doing something it's so pretty out here all the blooming greens That's really all the separate self is, is a point of attention based in thought that's constricted on one aspect of an infinite aspect reality. This right now. Like, like I was saying in the beginning, it can be looked at as I'm walking or walking is, am I walking or is walking happening to me? It depends on where this constricted attention of mind is and what it's identifying itself as. Am I seeing or is seeing happening? What's the difference between seeing and really giving something a good look? What's the difference between hearing and really listening closely? 
it's that it's the tension it's the tension of this ego how we think we're in here doing it it's the tension of the ego trying to do what's already happening and this can be called a double bind because it's futile it's a it's a it's a thought based i'm i'm seeing but the thought i'm seeing has nothing to do with seeing the thought i'm hearing has nothing to do with hearing and if anything the senses operate more clearly when we aren't thinking about them, when we aren't trying to do them. You know, in this, in this way that I'm talking about how the only difference between seeing and I'm seeing is, is, an, is a, a tension of the mind and the separate ego thinking it's doing what's happening. But what's going on is there's sights, there's thoughts, there's feelings, there's smells, there's sounds. But I have constricted my consciousness, constricted what's going on down into this funnel. And that's why in psychology, they talk about the ego as the, the, the spotlight, you know? I've constricted my consciousness down into thinking that I'm this, I'm that. Losing sight of, or sort of making vague and blurry the rest of the whole thing going on. When somebody tells you, you know, this reminds me of a story Alan Watt shares, to focus, what do you do? You tense up, you... You know, if you're focusing on your sight, you tense up the muscles around your eyes and you, or if you focus on the sounds, you like, it's this, it's, a, it's, it's this tension. It's this constriction. And that's really what we are, what the ego is, the, the separate self or the false self. Ugh. It's a thought-based concept of, and you know, you can't blame yourself because we've been taught and we've been conditioned to think in this way that who I am is this body. Or if you're all spiritual, I am awareness. But that's the same constriction. Who we are doesn't, proclaim itself to be it is this it's the bugs flying it's the tr it's the leaves blowing it's the birds chirping it's reality but there's this strange feeling that i am in here in my body, in this world, behind my thoughts, as this sort of isolated awareness which sees everything but itself. And we aren't even, in that sense, we aren't even aware of ourselves. We aren't even aware of what we think we are and what we identify ourselves as. 
if some like Buddhist monk tells you to, you're asking him, how do I get enlightened? And he goes and says, go find yourself. Or you see some fancy Instagram post that says, you need to find yourself. I need to go and find myself. What do we do? What do we do? What does that entail for one to find oneself? It sends you out on this marvelous excursion where you spend the rest of your life trying to find this thing that isn't out there because the thing you're trying to find is the thing that's searching. I'm going to find myself. How do you find what you are? You know? And it's the same way with senses. Am I seeing sights? Am I hearing sounds? Am I aware of thoughts? Or is this all just coming in? It's here. Sights are. Seeing is. There's not a me that sees. There's not a me that hears. There are sounds. There are sights. There are thoughts. And in this sort of big thought bank, there's this, there's this repetitive cycle of thinking that's going, I'm seeing or I'm hearing, or I feel this way, or this is happening to me, or I'm making a video, or I'm out in the woods. These are all just thoughts, and they have nothing to do with you, in essence. They are a relative truth in that they can, they, they sort of, it's a localizing tool. It's, it's, and this is where we can understand how the mind is a servant. The idea, the thought, I'm out in the woods, it's helpful. It, you know, it, it's better than sitting here delusionally going, I am in a city. In that way, the relative truth of the thinking mind is helpful. It's like a localizer. But we, we get bound in this thinking mind to the degree that we lose sight of just pure happening, which is what we are, or at least what I think we are, what I think I am. And we become this illusory, objective thing which is maintained by what we're thinking. I'm sad. I'm scared. I'm lost. I'm doomed. I'm happy. I'm angry. These are all thought forms. And we, we completely surrender what, if there was any free will, it goes out the window by adhering to these thoughts. If there was any freedom, if there was any peace, if there was any choice, it's gone when we lose ourselves in the thinking mind. If an ego is told to go and find itself, like I was saying a moment ago, it, go, it goes to try and find itself. 
and how does it do such a thing? Reminds me of a quote of Ramana Maharshi. Someone asked him something along those lines, how do I get enlightened or how do I find myself? And Ramana says, asking how to find yourself is like being at this ashram and asking for directions to this ashram. Why? Why? You're here. You are it. You are always aware of yourself. But it's this conceptual, separate thinking mind that thinks finding itself or realizing itself is something so grandiose and so, they think something's going to happen. Something's going to change. I'll become truly powerful. I'll become truly happy. I will no longer suffer when I find myself. We are always ourselves, but we think we're not. We think we're this separate self. We think we're not in truth. We think we're ignorant or di distorted or caught up in illusions. And to one extent, sure, because these are beautiful, they're, they're fingers pointing to the moon and it, it, it can get us back on track to hear these types of things that you don't exist or go and find yourself or go and sit and do nothing or let go, surrender, give up. These things, they can help us and get us back on track with what the guru is really trying to convey here. And it sends us on this trip of trying to find ourselves or trying to do nothing or trying to trying to let go or trying to give up and be happy truly letting go or truly finding yourself or truly doing nothing is when you stop trying truly not the cute little I'm going to stop trying because my guru told me to do that and I'll get enlightened. That's not stopping trying. You're still trying. You're still trying to do this thing that you think will make you make the world beautiful. <sighs> Truly giving up is when you give up. You, you realize the futility of your own selfishness, your own seeking of goodness and seeking of wanting to feel good or to be have authority or to f be popular or get money or whatever whatever you're chasing after giving up is when you literally i'm done like there is no point there is no it's meaningless it's futile it's completely pointless and you realize this in essence that you have no control over this thing that's just happening and you give up people that have experienced people that lived through experiences of knowing they were going to die. I've, I've gone through an experience like this and here I am, I'm alive. I knew I was gonna die. And I couldn't do anything about it. And all these incredibly powerful feelings of sadness 
and fear and memories and were rushing through my being and I can't do anything. I was, I had no chance. I was done for, this was it. And many people that go through these experiences where they, the separate self knows it's going to die, but they don't, there can be an awakening in that. There can be an en a liberation in that. Where you realize that's what's always going on. That's what's always going on. Is that we are trying to control this thing. Whatever this is. And the we that is trying to control it is this collage of thoughts and feelings. Memories. Imagine for, your, for a moment that you didn't know anything, no more memories. You don't know anything from the past. You don't know this idea of who you think you are and that you're this human and you are, exist here inside this earth and forget all that, forget it all. You still are. If you can find that space where you, you can let go of memory and let go of identification, intellectual and conceptual identification, all that's left is this. No separation, breathing, body, sensing, you don't, you're not thinking about it. You're not thinking of who you used to be or who you think you are or how things should be or how you're sad and let all that go. This is why some gurus, their instruction is look at the world as a newborn child. Once again, they're saying give up. Let it go. Be with what is. Realize you are one with all of this. All these, all these statements, you don't exist. It's all one. You, there's nothing you can do about it. Find yourself. They all ring a similar bell. They're all pointing to something. And they're pointing to you right now. And they're saying, come on. What am I going to have to say to you to get you to remember? What rascally little mission am I going to have to send you on for you to realize your own futility to realize that you can't do anything about you because you the you you think you are doesn't exist it's simply who you think you are while who you are is growing and aging and walking and breathing growing their hair waving the trees, rising the sun. It's just this. It's just this right now. And who we think we are go, oh God, like, 
I'm this, I'm doing all this, like, oh, if I don't exist, who's going to take care of all this? Who's, who's in charge here? Who's running the show? That's the panic of death, which doesn't have to be associated with the physical death. The panic is the death of who we think we are, the psychological death, which is where the term ego death actually originated from back in the 60s, the 50s, 60s, 70s area. I don't know what time. That was what that term was denoting to, is ego death, not, not the death of this body, but the death of the psychological self that we think we are. And when this self is confronted with its own supposed apparent death or is dying, going through the, whether it be through a chemical they ingested or through the natural ongoing realization of their own futility, realizing and panicking to itself, who's gonna, who's gonna, get me up in the morning who's going to go to my go to work who's going to mow the lawn who's going to take out the trash who's going to take care of me i i need to be here to run the show cuz if i'm not here nothing exists but that's just it right there nothing is all that's existing it's this right now it's been existing the whole time. Do you think all these trees and plants around me are like, gotta grow, gotta grow, gotta shoot more tendrils of roots. Where's that water? Oh shit, when's the water coming? Got to shoot the leaves out. Got to do the thing. Oh no, bugs are on me. Who knows? Who knows? I just know that that's how I live life. That's how humans tend to live life is through the lens of this. The one that's inside. The one that's in here looking out it appears to me that the rocks hello tick the rocks and the trees and the wind itself it's not that they're doing nothing it's not that they're doing something they are. It is. And when you get that spiritual instruction, that, that spiritual background going, you say, okay, I gotta, I gotta mimic that. I gotta be that. I gotta go and sit and do nothing. I gotta go and be nothing. Because that'll tune me into my true self, right? That'll... That, that'll allow me to find myself. But you can't do nothing. How do you do nothing? Nothing is this self that we are. Nothing is what is. So you can't go and do what is. You can't even go and do something. That's the bind of the thinking mind. It can't do something about it and it can't not do something about it. What is it to do nothing about it? What is it to not, not worry about it? 
or forget it or give up. If we're wording it to ourselves, it's this, it's this internalized, rascally way of saying, saying this to myself, feeling like this to myself will really get me what I want. And we don't like to admit that to ourselves. Saying, whatever, I don't care. If we didn't care, we wouldn't be proclaiming that. That's the idea of how the, the self doesn't proclaim itself. It is the self. But the ego needs everybody and itself to know who it is and know what it's doing and know it's doing the right thing and analyze, engage, and monitor what we call this exterior world and the internal world to make sure everything is to a T just how it should be, how it ought to be. Because it can't bear to let go of itself. It's the one running the show. It's the one who needs to be. It's the one who must not die. You know how when like you take a cigarette or you take like take a stick and light the end of it on fire and you whip it around really quick it looks like there's a circle created by the ember it looks like there's a circle there it's the circle is present the circle exists but what's going on is this one little thing is going so fast that it appears to create this image of a circle. And you can think of the circle, which in one way isn't really there, but is rather an illusion of a circle. It's relatively there as a circle. You can think of this circle as the separate self. You get these thoughts and feelings and that chronic tension of the mind, if you get it going quick enough, it seems like you're there. It seems like I exist. You get the thoughts going quick enough. You get the feeling of who you think you are going enough. You appear to be there. but really you are a very fast repetition of thoughts and feelings. The false you, that's just the false you, you know, who we identify ourselves with. And you don't even need to try to do this. I'm sure you do do it. I do it. I've been taught into it and habitually identify with it. It's kind of what we're taught to do here is we identify with these very fast and, and repetitive thought forms and feelings. This is who I am. 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 You get that going fast enough and it appears that this is who you are. But what's that all taking place in? Who's minding all the rest of existence that lies outside of or separate from this you that you think you are. I guess in one way you can say how this whole thing is very fast repetitions. You know, like the scientists talking about how rocks aren't actually solid but are rather tons of these little bitty things racing around so fast that it appears solid. Or like if a fan is going super fast, you can't poke through it, 
even though there's only like four prongs and there is space between them, it's going so fast that you can't feel the space. And yes, once again, in this same way, this space, where is it? How do we get in tune with this space that's being so filled to the brim with thoughts and feelings and memories The reason gurus and meditation teachers urge you to focus on a mantra or a single point, like your breath, which is a very common one, or repeating a mantra to yourself, is because if you do this in faith, if you do this fully with concentration, and true focus, you sort of slide into this space where all the mind is doing, it's been, it's been distilled down into this one point where the mind itself, which is what, you know, modulates and keeps the separate self alive when it collapses down into this simple instruction of one word or one point of focus or one sense it forgets itself it forgets that it was instructed to focus on this whatever it is in particular while you, in complete entirety, remain. And what's left is this, all of this. Nothing, nothing crazy. But who, we, who you think you are doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. It's been collapsed down into rising, falling, rising, falling, or I am, I am, I am, I am. The mind is very, very mechanical, and that's what these mantras utilize, is the mechanical, robotic nature of the thinking mind. And this is also the mechanical and robotic nature of the separate self, the ego. That's why gurus are so good at sending you on all these crazy trips that make you remember, that make you realize. Before you completely fall out of existence of who you think you are, you become very quiet. You become very calm, very centered. You're not thinking of all these past events or potential futures and hopes and dreams or you're not focused on the senses of your body or what you should be doing or you become very quiet and it's around that stage kind of like when you're falling asleep in bed and you're just about to fall asleep and then you jerk your whole body back to awake 
when you're doing these meditations and become very, very, very quiet, suddenly this thought comes up that you just can't resist and it's going, it's working. I'm meditating really good right now. This is the best meditation I've ever had. I think I'm getting somewhere. And like floodgates opening, all of the thinking mind just kind of creeps back in. And it didn't really go anywhere. It just you weren't focused on it. You weren't whipping that cigarette around so fast that you got who you think you are locked in time. The cigarette is going very slow. <laughs> and then we beat ourselves up. Oh, I fell out of the meditation. Oh, I lost my point of attention. Rather than just returning to the focal point and going back into this space, we beat ourselves up and guilt, guilt trip ourselves that we're not doing something right. Like I was saying earlier, the, the guru or the teacher, they're really just looking at you like, come on, just give it up. Forget it and you'll remember. Stop seeking and you will find. Sometimes they'll say paradoxical things like that and you go, wow, very wise, very pretty. You're so enlightened. I want to be like you. And they're just like, <laughs> they're trying to get you to forget to realize that you you aren't doing you can't do anything about this because you are this so why are you trying? What's the hassle? All you're doing, to the degree of even coming to see this guru, is creating more of a snowball effect of this seeking to do something. Sit down and look in. What do you really want? What are you really doing? What are you really looking for? in this life. We just want to be happy. We want to feel good. Why do we want to feel good? What's so wrong with bad feelings? Oh, it's a drag. It makes it, it hurts. It makes this whole thing seem meaningless. Was this thing supposed to have a reason? Was this thing supposed to feel good? Is that what life's about? Is feeling good? This type of inquiry, as Alan Watts puts it, eventually it gets you to realize, well, damn, I'm just a son of a bitch out for my own good. I just want to feel good. I just want to not worry. I just want to be happy. And admitting that to ourselves, that I am suffering because I want to be happy, is a very crucial turning point. A very important turning point. 
because at that point when you really dig that when you really realize your own futility that wow i am selfish and i can't do anything about it because anything i'm to do about it is because i'm so selfish You're basically seeing samsara. You're seeing attachment. You're seeing identification with this thing that you can't get out of. You think, oh God, this is, this is dreadful. I'm going to kill myself. Is that not just another thing you think to do to get you out? How are you so sure of yourself that killing yourself frees? It's almost like, since we think killing ourselves makes us nothing, it's almost like deep down we know nothing, not worrying about this thing I've created, is where the peace lies, you know? Or being depressed, sleeping all day, it's because that deep sleep, where there is no me that suffers there just is and is some more we don't know what happens when we die we like to think we know and believe in stories of people that seem like they know but we don't know this is what we know right now. As you watch this video, this is it. And it'd be nice to accept this because there's nothing else we can do about it. Be with what is. And realize how much hell we put ourselves through from trying to seek good and seek the pleasurable. You know, if you, if you haven't noticed yet, nothing really lasts. Aside from the eternal you that has been and still is and will be, which we've lost sight of by, by swinging that cigarette around so quick and being the separate self, doing, 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 doing in the name of feeling good. Realize how nothing seems to last. Not even our lives, not even this body, it's dying. It's, it's still in this growing and then it's gonna make this little flip somewhere or other and then start decaying. And we can debate on when that flip occurs. All the trees come and go. All these flies that are up in my shit, this whole video, they're only gonna be alive for probably the next 48 hours. rocks they sort of seem to outlive us because they're not you know whatever story they're not organic they're not they're not as delicate and fleshy but they they're crumbling they're falling apart they're being eaten by fungus and environment and weather you know they're falling apart these rocks right here that make up this fire pit that i'm looking at are earth falling apart rivers dry up or return to this big source where they're sucked up into the sky and then fall down if you identified with the river and it dries up you know what now 
you better switch your identification to where it went, to what it's doing, what's actually going on, which is the constant flux, the constant fluctuation of this. Nothing's stable, nothing's, you know, back to the cigarette analogy. It can seem like, oh, that rocks, that it just is. But it's just doing this really quick, really repetitive motion every day. <laughs> if I could sit here, like imagine being able to sit here and being able to witness 10 years a second. My body would rot into this little bag of trash and the amount of stuff that I'd go through and seeing the forest come up and fall and the weather and the snow coming in and if you could see that because time seems to be what we're stuck in here and why we think oh this is gonna last this is what's up if you could see how it's not going to you wouldn't attach to it so hard you wouldn't want to. You'd realize, oh my God, where'd it go? That's what I was attached to? I thought I was attached to a tree and now it's a pile of mush. I thought I was attached to this beautiful rock formation, but now it's just a pile of little grit. I thought I was attached to this beautiful being, but now they're a pile of bones. I am a turning into a pile of bones. Stop, stop, stop. Make it last. Make something stable and permanent for me here, because that's what I'm looking for. We want something to last because we know where nothing does. Whether we've inquired into that or not we want something to last because we know nothing does i like that little statement of it's kind of paradoxical of nothing lasts nobody exists when you look in like when you look into that in a sort of like linguistic way Nothing is indeed what exists. Nothing exists. All that exists is nothing. <laughs> Nobody is the real existence, the what exists. Nobody exists. I've heard this funny little story of uh, this guy that was... Um, who's like advocating uh, nobody for president and think of nobody as the, the president. Nobody for president. Why, people ask? Well, it's because nobody cares. Nobody really cares. Nobody loves you. Nobody gives a damn. Nobody will save you. See how we kind of imbue the void and sunyata, imbue the emptiness with what we actually want? Nothing is eternal. Nothing makes me happy. Yeah, you got it, dude. Nothing is in control. Nothing exists. All these beautiful little spins of meaning and perspective.
feel like I could just go on and on. Um, but my phone's got low battery and I'd like to just take some time to just sit out here. And not really do anything partic in particular, but just be. Um, but if you watched, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to me ramble about the non-dual nature of reality. Um, and I hope you enjoyed. And I will be back with more. I'll see you guys.